Well, the clock has formally struck noon. Welcome all. We are thrilled to have you for our Graham School gathering, exploring democracy in an age of distrust and disinformation, a conversation with Eric Schoenberg, who is the founder of the Alliance for Trust in Media. We are here today in a series that has focused first on the decline of truth, and we will make sure for those who missed it that you have access to that video with Michael Rich, the former president of Rand Corporation, where he described how there are a number of trends that have led to a decay of facts in public discourse. One of those major trends was the changing media environment. And today, we're going to have an opportunity to speak to someone who is at the very forefront of this question of trust in media, Eric Schoenberg. Eric is a longtime business journalist and media executive, now the founder of the Alliance for Trust in Media, a nonprofit organization devoted to building a relationship of trust and recognition between journalists and their audiences. Before the Alliance, he held several leadership roles in journalism, most recently as CEO of Mansueto Ventures, the home of the iconic business media brands, Inc. and Fast Company. Most importantly to me as Dean of the Graham School, we are thrilled to call Eric our distinguished instructor of journalism, and we are looking forward to his course this summer on media trust and the 2024 elections that will dive into this topic in what we anticipate right now may be one of the most polarizing moments in American history. And so uh, good on you, Eric, for trying to teach about how we can explore media and trust in that very moment of polarization likely reaching its peak. Uh, for the six years prior to being the CEO of Minnesota Ventures, he was the president and editor-in-chief of Inc. And he also currently holds a number of other roles. Uh, we are very proud to call him an advisor to the Leadership and Society Initiative here at the university. And he is on the board of the book publisher Amplify Publishing Group. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Eric, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so all of you can see him. He is going to have a presentation of about 20 to 25 minutes where he will lay out this issue. And during that time, I will be eagerly watching the chat because we want this to be interactive and engage your questions. So while he will be speaking and will be focused on speaking, I will be reading anything that you are chiming in with and then organizing those into the questions that will follow his presentation. So let me just start inviting you early and often to chime in with any questions you may have for Eric for the discussion that follows. Eric, can I turn it over to you? Yes, you can, Seth. Thank you very much for that kind intro. And I am now going to try to share my screen. We should have a full screen that has a slide that says democracy in the age of distrust and disinformation. Everything good? Everything is good. We see it perfectly. All right, then let us get started. Uh, and let me start the way journalists often do with an anecdotal lead, a, a story. This one about my encounter with the lady from Cincinnati. Uh, the year is 2016. I am at that time the editor in chief of Inc. Magazine and I'm on a panel before an audience of entrepreneurs from my hometown of Cincinnati. Now, I thought the panel went great. I, held forth about journalistic integrity. And I even dropped in a lot of really apt quotes from Shakespeare. So as I walked off the stage, I was feeling pretty good. And this lady approaches me and asks, can I ask you a question? And I'm all prepared for, how do you know so many apt quotes from Shakespeare? And instead she says, why do you journalists always lie. Why do you journalists always lie? Clearly, the lady from Cincinnati and I have totally different ideas of what constitutes truth and where you go to find it in today's information environment. And yet, we vote in the same elections. Isn't this a problem? In 1787, Another lady asked Ben Franklin a question. What kind of government had he and his fellows created, drafted, at the Constitutional Convention? 
then he famously answered, a republic, if you can keep it. If we're going to keep this republic, there is a lot that needs to be fixed. Then you can take your pick. Gerrymandering, money in politics, the crisis at the southern border, income inequality, government overreach. But we're going to focus today just on one of those things that needs fixing, which is the information environment. Now, when people beat up on the media, they could mean a whole raft of very different things. They could mean classic mainstream journalism. Maybe they mean cable TV shouting heads. Maybe they mean Russian or Iranian troll farms or Joe Rogan podcasts or QAnon videos on YouTube. The information ecosystem is all these things everywhere, all at once. It's a mess. But it's the media we have, and we need media in a democracy. Media is the only lens we have through which we view the stories that hold us together as a nation and that help us understand the problems we need to solve together. There's a reason the press is the only industry singled out for protection in the Constitution. And if we can't find our way to the people who are doing their best to tell us the truth, then we're at the mercy of those who trade in rumors and demagoguery and who profit from tearing us apart. So, how are we doing? Well, here's some data. Now, this graphic shows the decline in trust Americans have in media. The direction of these lines is probably no surprise to you, but note that recently, the share of people who have no trust at all in media has surpassed the share that have a lot of trust or a fair amount combined. Now, maybe you think, well, I mean, that's just the way media works. Lots of stable democracies have polarized media. Well, actually, it's much worse here. In the UK and Germany, the most watched media is concentrated around the middle of the political spectrum. In the US, there's no media in the middle and the range of polarization is much wider. And if you think all this tension has no effect on our bedrock commitment to democracy, I consider this. When asked in a Pew survey whether it was more important to have a strong leader or a democracy, 30% said they were at least somewhat willing to throw democracy under the bus. Houston, we have a problem. And what do we do about a problem that is so sprawling, so complex, so wicked? Well, um, as with lots of large problems, it, it helps to break it down into smaller pieces. So in this case, into the supply side of the information ecosystem and the demand side. Now, it makes sense to start on the supply side, because it's obvious, right? All you have to do is constrict the supply of falsehood and then load up on the good stuff, the trustworthy stuff. Except who decides what's trustworthy? In the US, the First Amendment draws some pretty bright lines around that question. Now, as a journalist, I always thought the First Amendment was meant to empower a free press to hold those in power to account, like a watchdog. But that's only part of what the First Amendment says. It also says that with few exceptions, government can't curtail anyone's freedom to spread junk facts, junk science, junk speech. What protects the watchdogs also protects the junkyard dogs. Another obstacle to squeezing polarization out of the supply side is media itself. Everyone blames social media with good reasons. So Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. The algorithms on all of those platforms are optimized for one purpose, which is to keep you scrolling so they can show you more ads and earn more money. And what keeps you scrolling is content that triggers outrage or fear of the other. Truth is nice, but polarization, 
and it's profitable. And while it pains me to say this, mainstream media has the same conflict. Unlike an algorithm, a newsroom editor has professional norms that value accuracy, but we journalists still define news as drama. We aspire to truth, but by instinct and training, we're drawn towards conflict. We reward polarizing voices with attention. A few years ago, two academic researchers tracked which members of Congress got the most media coverage. They found that the New York Times gave more coverage to extremist members of Congress than to moderates by a ratio of three to one. So these are the rules by which the supply side operates. If you want an audience, there's little downside to lying and lots of upside to pushing polarization. So go ahead. Threaten to shut down the government, default on the national debt, call the other side racist or call them pedophiles or call them vermin. Some media are gonna cheer you, some will be horrified, but all of them will put you on the front page. Think about it. Why do we all know Marjorie Taylor Greene or AOC better than we know our own member of Congress? As long as the rules of the game remain unchanged, the players in the game have no reason to change their behavior. Now, I believe that some knowledge institutions like public health or journalism at its best can restore some of the trust they've lost by changing their behavior. But if you really wanna change the game at scale, you have to change the incentives. You have to change the rules. Now, Nobody likes regulation, but there is some evidence that when asked to weigh squelching misinformation against protecting unlimited free speech, most Americans choose the squelch. This graph shows that majorities would prefer to take down false posts, especially if the misinformation is harmful. Now, given the questions asked in this survey, it's not surprising that Democrats and independents show more support for this than Republicans, but still the support is across the board more than you would think. Now, what that says to me is that no one, regardless of party, wants to be fed lies. But it's also pretty clear that policymakers in a gridlocked Congress don't have the ability to act on this desire while balancing the need for free expression. Even if they could agree on how to thread that needle, which they don't. Now, some vision of how to do this is emerging in Europe. The EU's Digital Services Act, which goes into full effect next month, requires large social media platforms to allow their data to be seen by researchers um, the act also coordinates with a voluntary code of practice around disinformation, which aims to minimize content like election disinformation. Now, it remains to be seen how well this works in the EU in practice. And of course, it only applies to large social media, but it's a step and a reasonable one. In the US so far, the action tends to be at the state level. And right now, the steps being taken tend to restrict content moderation more than restricting speech. So Texas and Florida have laws forbidding social media platforms from removing content based on the political view expressed. The attorneys general of Missouri and Louisiana have sued the U.S. government saying that efforts to alert content moderators to COVID misinformation constitutes suppression of free speech. Now, all of these are under appeal and the Supreme Court is due to take up the issues this year and we'll see how that works out. In the US, it's safe to say that the regulatory posture right now is to assert that all claims are equally valid. Government cannot put its thumb on the scale to support factuality, even if citizens want it. On the supply side, by way of conclusion, I'd say the path to a shared reality is gonna be a slog. Which means that when it comes to curating a healthy information environment, 
most of the burden is going to be on the demand side. And the demand side means us, us news consumers. The obstacle on the supply side that we've just seen is perverse incentives. On the demand side, it's perverse psychology. The problem is us and our all too easily manipulated paleolithic brains. Now, I am sure that no one on this Zoom call consumes disinformation. We all believe in science, for example. But of course, when we say that, what we mean is not that we have personally reviewed the research and decided to give our thumbs up to mRNA. What we mean is, is that we trust the sources that told us that vaccines work. In other words, we smart people have our understanding of reality mediated by the information microclimate we build around ourselves, just like everybody else. Now, research suggests that maybe we should be humble about how reliable those microclimates really are. In this survey, the average participant told researchers they figured that they were better than 71% of the rest of the population at detecting disinformation. In fact, they weren't. After reading misinformation, they were three times more likely to make incorrect statements than before. We are, all of us, at the mercy of certain unconscious mental shortcuts and biases. Even the most elementary propaganda tricks fool us. Like for example, what psychologists call the illusory truth effect, the seeming veracity generated by simply hearing a lie repeated over and over again. Now, what's humbling about this is that the illusory truth effect works whether the lie is plausible or ludicrous on its face. All that counts is the repetition. It's not a matter of our being dumb or dishonest. It's just the way our brains are wired. We can't help ourselves. When we say we're seeking truth, often what we're really seeking is what feels true or what people like us believe. And when people like us means people who share our politics, then truth becomes irrelevant in public discourse. What we want to tell everyone all too often is not, look at how wise and thoughtful and open-minded I am. Instead, what we want to say is, look at how loyal I am to our tribe. I'm not saying that one truth is as good as another, that obviously not. There is such a thing as objective truth or else airplanes wouldn't fly and vaccines wouldn't save lives. What I am saying is that finding your way to those objective facts is increasingly your responsibility. And that a first step to doing so is to understand your own biases and mental shortcuts and to understand that there are people out there trying to manipulate you and your beliefs by exploiting those shortcuts, by triggering outrage or appealing to your tribal loyalties or to the illusory truth effect or uh, any other of the tools of propaganda. Given human nature, you know, it's easier in many cases to recognize the techniques employed by hyperpartisan media than it is to figure out the veracity or falsehood of the content. In other words, at scale, it's kind of easier to prevent polarizing claims from taking root in the first place than to discredit them once they've been taken on board. So think not of debunking, but of rebunking. Last year, for example, Google released a series of videos in Eastern Europe that warned people away from anticipated false claims about Ukrainian refugees committing crimes. 38 million people saw the videos and afterwards surveys showed that they were less likely to believe those false claims about a criminal migrant crime wave when as predicted anti-migrant parties promoted them. Now, news literacy training is pre-bunking at scale News literacy doesn't aim to target any particular claim like this Google experiment did. 
Instead, it helps you distinguish a new source that is trying to manipulate you from one that is trying to tell you the truth. The skills of news literacy rely heavily on the kind of healthy skepticism and, and evidence-based reasoning that journalists and scientists, juries, employ when they're trying to separate fact from fiction. Now, the good news is that a dozen or so states have some measures on the books to teach news literacy schools uh, skills in school. I happen to think that companies could do the same for their employees, much the way many already offer financial literacy training. In fact, I mean, just as an aside, that's one of the aims of my startup, the Alliance for Trust in Media, which is to give news literacy skills to people in the workplace. After all, adults consume news more than school kids do, and they vote. So for companies that worry about the effects of polarization on workplace cohesion or morale, this seems like a no-brainer, especially since advance this. It is staying on that slide. Eric. It is stuck on this slide, yes. Let's see. I do you want to stop sharing for a moment and I'm gonna pause there? the sharing and um yeah, I'll stop the sharing. And resume it. Perfect. Yep, it switched and so Okay. Uh, if you resume, hopefully we'll make it past that slide. Uh, there we go. All right. There we go. Perfect. So what this slide is about is that polarization is probably not as widespread as people think. So this is a survey in which Democrats and Republicans were both shown statements on either side of a polarizing issue, like um, does racism still exist or are Muslims good Americans? And then they were asked to guess how much the other side believes that statement. Um, in the test, both sides way overestimated how radical the other side was and underestimated how much agreement existed. Uh, we may believe that we can't stand the people on the other side of the aisle, but maybe what we can't stand are the mirages created in our minds by our own screwed up information environment. So the question is, um, what does it mean to be news literate in this crazy information environment? So here are four basic rules. The first, don't let your emotions overpower your judgment. If you feel yourself starting to feel outraged or shocked when you read a headline, just stop. Don't share the headline. Cool down first. Consider where you got the news and what evidence, if any, supports the claim? Does the story cite multiple sources? How credible are those sources? How good is the evidence? And is it clearly marked whether you're reading news or opinion? And then check whether other news out outlets are telling the same story, just like you would get a second opinion from a doctor. Comparing stories is a good way to recognize the spin or bias that is part of every news outlet. And finally, be humble enough to admit that you don't know the whole story, especially in a fluid situation like a war. Now, this kind of intellectual humility will not win you a gazillion followers on Insta, but it will do a much better job of guiding you to the truth. Now, let me go back to the lady from Cincinnati to whom I am grateful for showing me how much I needed to learn. If I had that encounter to do all over again, I wouldn't have tried to prove her wrong and me right, which never works anyway. Instead, I'd have tried to understand why she felt that way. People feel the way they feel for a reason. But also, I would have stood my ground. I know for a fact how hard most journalists work 
to get the facts right. Yes. And after listening to her respectfully, I've told her my experience. And while that would never have changed her mind on the spot, maybe I'd have given her a reason to reconsider just as she'd given me a reason to rethink my views. Now, two folks from Cincinnati in a respectful conversation are not going to save democracy. But maybe one small brick in the wall that divides us could be slightly dislodged. Democracy was always a participation sport, and that's more true now than ever. Getting the country back to a shared reality is an all-hands-on-deck emergency. We all have a role to play. If you are a policymaker, you should be exploring ways to clean up the sludge of falsehood while preserving respect for free expression. And if you're an information professional, a journalist, say, or a public health official, you should be searching your soul to understand how your style of communicating has fed polarization. And you and I, us news consumers, we need to acknowledge that getting to factuality is now our job too. We need to approach news with self-awareness, open-mindedness and good judgment. And we need to teach our kids and employees how to do the same. The path back to the shared reality that our democracy desperately needs starts with us. Thank you. And I think we now have time for questions. Let me, before that, just put this one slide up. I have been thinking about this issue nonstop since I left Inc. and Fast Company. Um, and I would be delighted to talk to anyone who shares my concern. So here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out. Thank you, Eric. That was share that and I will uh, uh, to copy that and I'll stop sharing right now. Okay. Brilliant presentation. Thank you, Seth. Uh, thank you. And uh, let's jump into questions and I'm gonna try to divide them into two parts. Um, I wanna start, even though I hear your points that really the demand side is the most important. I want to start by looking at the supply side, and then we'll come over and talk about how we influence the demand side. Um, on the supply side, um, I want to start with the graph that you put out that showed how our country differs from some of our European peers. What was striking about that is that we had, you know, on both sides of the center, <laughs> but very little in the center, uh, similar to our peers in Germany and Britain. And I'll just add to this conversation, my own personal experience. Um, I lived in the UK from 2001 to 2003. And we were in a very different environment in the US at that time, where we had less of a sense, I believe at that time, that our media had a particular bias. So I would usually see myself in the US reading just the New York Times or just the journal. Or uh, when I got to Britain, what was fascinating to me was that a lot of peers uh, who were British would read The Guardian and The Times, for example, that would intend for them to be able to see uh, the news and knowing that they each maybe had at least a perceived bias, they would try to then mix the two together, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to today, and we're in a place where, from your data, we're showing those peers as having more of a center, and us as having now a place where our media has spread. And I, I just want to affirm that data, that The Economist just came out with a study that you may have seen that found that even the words that are being used in our media um, tend to have a significant relationship with a specific party. So in this particular example, The Economist found that from 2009 to 2023, uh, the words used in different stories um, in, for example, The Times was one of the places they surveyed, had moved very dramatically leftward over that, that time period, um, at least within our, our political context. Um, here's where I'm going with this long lead up. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what you see as the challenges that have led to this supply side? 
Meaning, why do you think we're here as compared to Europe? Is it just that the demand wants this and so our media have followed that? Or is there something structural that is not allowing us to produce content at the perceived center? Okay, that's a great question, Seth. So the thing that distinguishes the media environment in the UK and uh, Germany is the 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 widespread use of public media. So the BBC and the ADF in Germany are publicly funded news outlets that have in their charter a nonpartisan approach and people trust that. And, th and those are widely consumed news. Now, obviously there are partisans on in both in Germany and in the UK as there are here, but we don't have that public media. Then there's also what's happened just in the past 25 years in the US, which is the decline in media business model, which has done a number of things. It has hollowed out local media, those you know, local newspapers, about 25% of them in the past couple of decades have shuttered. The national media have been laying people off left and right, and you probably have read about the layoffs at the LA Times, the closing of Sports Illustrated, um, and you could go on and on farther back. What that does to the models in, or to the, the news reporting in those challenged news outlets in our beleaguered industry right now is that it makes them more desperate to reach out to audiences and give them what they want. Um, there, I think that is a particular issue. There is, um, as I said, polarization is profitable and giving audience the kind of outrage that they demand, um, that, you know, that seems to satisfy us to kind of be on the red team or the blue team is kind of what is demanded by the business model now. Also, in addition, um, if you can't, if you, if your newsroom is hollowed out, what happens is that you tend to add a lot more opinion to your news output. I mean, opinion just requires you to hire one columnist to read a bunch of other sources of news. It doesn't require you to send a reporter to the state house or to develop sources inside a government agency. Um, and so over time, it is true uh, and measured by data that the amount of the proportion of output coming out of you know, well-regarded outlets like the Washington Post and the New York Times, and I assume many other places, is weighting more towards opinion and analysis than straight reporting. There is a question from Irene Ronblum uh, in the chat that follows this conversation directly. Um, and she writes, agreed, but what about NPR and PBS? And uh, I'm just curious if you can comment a little bit on that, meaning, you know, you had mentioned the public media in Europe. Um, and I don't think they are suggesting that they see an equivalency, but I think just the question of why hasn't NPR and PBS uh, been able to maybe hold that center more uh, as it has been able to do in, in other countries? Well, it's not as the, the funding model is very different. It requires, um, you know, it's locally based um, and it also has a lot of donation from, um, you know, rich people as well as as people who uh, you know are listeners in the catchment area or viewers in the catchment area um and it's just not as widely viewed so it doesn't have the same kind of weight as the bbc has in the uk say right well so that's um on the supply side i'm going to pause there and just name that in a month we'll be having another conversation with you where we're going to go deep into the media business model and you're gonna go further into the work that you're doing at the Alliance to try to examine and then move that business model in a direction of greater trust. And so I'll share that to say, we will talk more about the supply side in that conversation. Uh, but now is a perfect time, I think, to move to the demand side of this equation. And uh, you've laid out this very, detailed approach to kind of here's the challenge and then here are things we can do as critical consumers. Um, there's a really interesting question that follows that from 
Donald Flick. Uh, it's how do we teach skepticism? Uh, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about, you know, that idea more broadly of how do we, and this is another question in the chat from Seth Radwell, does the demand side require a whole new focus on civic education and social sciences? Like, how do you see, even, you know, though I realize this is beyond the alliance's immediate work, but how do you see kind of building that type of critical thinking? And, and maybe a follow-up is why you decided in your work to start focusing on the workforce as um, one segment of that population that you want to change the demand side approach. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll answer that last question first. Uh, I decided to focus on the workplace for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it, it seemed to me to be a more immediate way to reach people um, who are voters. So it is great to teach civics in school and you know, critical thinking in universities, but those, those people are not going to enter the electorate for a few years. Um, also, a workplace is a, a place where people are gathered together. Um, it, you don't have to reach out and promote to individuals to come learn about, um, you know, news literacy. They're already there. And there is precedent. As I noted, companies are already training employees in things like financial literacy and how to handle their 401k or their retirement plan and wellness. So it seemed like a reasonable step. Also, companies have an interest in um, you know, promoting harmony and the ability to converse across the aisle th throughout their workforce. An awful lot of companies, and I can say this also happened at Inc. and Fast Company, are divided by politics. And you need people to feel like they're part of the same team when they're at the company. Um, so those are the those are the main reasons. I one analogy. Um, I mentioned financial literacy training. One analogy that struck me just because of my background, I guess, as a, a financial journalist is that the transition away from the three broadcast spoon fed reality of, you know, 25, 30 years ago to today is like the transition in retirement planning and corporations from pensions in which everything was taken care of by your paternalistic company to 401ks where you're responsible for your own retirement health and you have to manage the investments and you have to decide how much to save. Um, it's similar. We have basically pushed the responsibility down to the individual users in both of those environments. That is a fascinating analogy. And I love it because I think that it speaks to how much more is on the individual today in a 24 seven, much uh, not regulated because it wasn't regulated before, but much more um, abundant information environment, right? And so information's abundance comes with so much more requirement on the individual to then sift through that information than it did in a time where there was less information and it was much more um, you know, uh, likely to, to be real. So a fascinating way to think about it. Um, how do you think about um, when when you when you think about the demand side, um, you know this question of um, what uh, and, and maybe this is supply and demand. What what crosses the line and how you might still draw some lines? So you mentioned the EU, you know, and let's just for the moment um, forget about where we are and. <laughs> And, and, and what maybe the Supreme Court will allow. What do you think is the right answer to, you know, how to think about disinformation? Um, and I'll come to a question in the chat. Andrea Gaynor asks, at what point does disinformation become equivalent to shouting fire in a crowded theater? And I'm curious if you could, you know, talk about that a little bit and how you thought about it. As well, there is right now, you know, a whole kind of legal world that is developing around this. Obviously, some of the January 6th cases, you mm -hmm. know, they are questioning what's allowed. The Fox News example, um, you know, I imagine is a major one in this. In it, but, but at the same time, I just want to say, and then I really do want to come to you for your expertise, Eric, what's challenging about even the Fox News example is that in that one, you know, really what experts think is that 
um, those same things may happen again. They just won't have the same proof. In that example, you know, you had anchors saying they absolutely knew 100% that they were saying false things. They were doing it anyway, just because they needed to put on broadcasts. Um, you know, in theory, that still happens, but they know now not to text each other. So, you know, I've heard from legal experts that that is a case where, you know, if the same thing happened again, it may be much harder to prove because, you know, the evidence. Uh, but, but anyway, coming to that big question, Eric, I apologize that it's poorly framed. Of how do you think about the question of, you know, what is the equivalent of shouting fire in a crowded theater? And how do you manage that, you know, domain? Because at some point, I think we would agree, it probably even gets to that, you know, place where even the court would say, you know, it's out of bounds. But curious for your thoughts on that. Well, uh, just to address Fox and and other cases in which uh, people have gotten in trouble for um, spreading false information, say around the 2020 election, like um, um, or for that matter, around the um, the Newtown shooting in Connecticut, the the way that we have handled this as a society is to prosecute people for creating individual harm. So you know that. The um, the Fox lawsuit was brought by a voting system okay. that claimed that its business was harmed by untruths told by Fox. Um, Rudy Giuliani has as a, a very large legal bill for making up um, lies about election workers, and Alex Jones um, is, you know, correctly being sued by people who he has tortured uh, online, and. Um, so that is how we've chosen to do this. So it's not the government weighing in and saying, Fox, you must pay because you told untruths, or even Dominion, the court saying you must pay um, fines because you told untruths. You're, you, you harmed people with untrue information, and that is a, a libel case. What I like about the EU uh, and the Digital Services Act is that it empowers users of the platforms to know what they're getting. So it doesn't say um, you have to tell the truth about COVID or you have to tell the truth about, you know, elections or migrants from Ukraine. What it says is if you're a large social media platform, you have to be very clear about what content you're going to take down and what content you're going to leave up. And you have to then report back to our authorities about how well you have been doing that. And then users have the ability to change their network if they don't like the content moderation policy. And that that seems to me to be a way to approach it, not to have government, God forbid, decide what is true or not, but have transparency into how the platforms are managing content moderation. And then you can imagine that there would be an opening for platforms that wanted to promote, you know, positive news that wanted to promote civil discourse would have a, a place in the marketplace of social media. Well, I know we don't have time for a lot more uh, questions, Eric, but let me um, come to one in the chat and then I have a final question for you. Um, on the supply side, uh, Seth Rad will ask, can we come up with um, new business models? We're, we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Let me ask this one, actually, I, I apologize. Jeffrey Liss asked, do we miss the old equal time requirement that had applied to the over the air broadcast media. Is there any way uh, to get that back more broadly? And yeah, can you just talk a little bit about um, that standard that obviously um, has changed dramatically with both the 24 seven cable news and the social media? Mm. Well, that rule applied over broadcast media because broadband, sort of the transmission spectrum, was considered a public good. And so any, you know, broadcast network that accessed the the um, spectrum was subject to government regulation. Um, but now when things are delivered over cable or through streaming, um, the government doesn't have any input into that. So that's, um, you know, there's, there's, there would be limited reach for the um, equal time rule anyway. It also dates back to a time when broadcast media was really focused on reaching the broadest audience. There was, you know, there were there was limited competition, and this was truly a mass market. 
Uh, and so the idea, I mean, you think back to what television shows were like in the 70s, they definitely tried to be as inoffensive as, po as possible. And that was the business model. Things are very different now. Uh, and so even if you used the um, the government's control over the broadcast spectrum to enforce that kind of even handedness, it would apply only to small parts of the information ecosystem. Well, Eric, we are at time, but, um, but we are gonna continue this conversation with you when we dig into media business models next month. Um, let me just give an odd reference to close. Uh, there is a scene in Frozen 2, uh, the dad of two daughters, uh, where Anna is trying to deal with her loss and she sings a song, The Next Right Thing. And there's a quote in it, because I do know the lyrics, uh, singing it with my kids. You are lost, hope is gone, but you must go on and do the next right thing. It's all about how in this really complex challenge and this sense of hopelessness, the best thing you can do is figure out where is there a positive way forward, even small, and you do that until you figure out the rest. And I just want to come back because you painted a very challenging picture. You put out, you know, where there's been a decline in the core business model of media. There's been a decline in the center of the country. And then you found this opportunity, which is, you know, the workplace and this place where maybe there can be a common standard and there's an incentive for people to find common ground. And there is a, an employer that might actually be willing to support bringing this in to help themselves and help the country. And so just wanna say that uh, it's striking how in a very challenging environment, you've begun to picture what that next right thing could be. And uh, we applaud you uh, and we look forward to continuing our conversation next month. And for those who did not get their question asked, um, some of it is because uh, as I saw your question, I realized that it would be the perfect question for next time. And so we will bring it with us as we go deep into the media business model, the ownership, and then where we go from here. Uh, any final words before we finish, Eric? No, oh, no, uh, nothing to add to that, Seth. Um, I will, I'll be looking at Frozen right now to to, to find my theme song. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. And thank you all for being part of this. Uh, we are all in this together and I really appreciate your interest. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Bye.